episode 28. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. This is your host, Enoch Sears, and today we're continuing our conversation with architect David Doucette, who's telling us about the run he had with Design Build a few years ago for three years and the difficulties of being a sole practitioner doing design and also doing build. So in this episode, we delve a little bit more into the, the mistakes he made when he was doing that and the lessons he learned about how to pull it off successfully. So some of the things we're going to discuss in this episode are, number one, how to be competitive when some contractors, not all, are engaging in shady practices that make it more difficult to compete. Also, how to weed out the bad or the less than, the less than optimal, shall we say, subcontractors to make sure that your jobs get done right. And there's a funny little story about some brown stuff on the ceiling. So you'll have to wait to hear that. So without further ado, here's our show. Hey, Agile Architects. This is Enoch from Business of Architecture. Welcome back. Today, we're going to continue our conversation with David Doucette. He's the founder of architectexamprep.com and cseprep.com. In addition to that, he runs an architecture firm, Reside Architecture. And we've been talking to him about his the wild heyday of his design build practice. So David, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me back. I'm, I'm glad that I was uh, that you were able to invite me back. But the content was so good that you said, David, we got to hear more. Absolutely. Now we're going to get into the juicy stuff, right? Exactly. Well, it already was pretty juicy. And, you know, it's interesting, but in our pre-interview, David, we definitely talked about how your experience in the design build industry was one of those um, aha moments where, you know, going into it, you had thought, okay, you know, that's there's money there. I'm leaving money on the table. The contractors make all the money. I'm going to get a piece of that. But then when you experienced it, there was just so many things that you hadn't expected or that didn't turn out the way you wanted. And so you're here basically to warn all the architects that are going down that path about what they can do differently. <laughs> That's exactly it. I mean, there was there was so many uh, unexpected uh, things that came up and, and things that realistically, uh, you know, we just can't anticipate. And that's part of when we launch our own business, uh, there's a lot of unknowns. And, and that fear is what keeps many of us from launching our own business uh, businesses. So um, there were, you know, I thought of a hundred reasons of why I couldn't, I shouldn't do this design build, but I was like, well, I'm going to do it because I'm going to do it. And that's what I did. And then you kind of learn on the job, which is what I did. And you adjust and, and, you know, you, you, you kind of refine, um, you, you refine your goals as you, you know, you move forward. And that's definitely what you did during that three that three year period is sort of learn and go with the process. Last in our last episode, you mentioned that you gave us an example of a project you did, a lead silver project in West Hollywood, and you sort of took us through the pro process of how the profit you thought you were going to make on that just started sort of disappearing as the cost mounted up and unexpected things happened. And you mentioned that you had. I'm going to start crying actually now that I'm thinking about <laughs> oh, this. <now>. No. <laughs> You mentioned that you had you had hired on about five or six employer, employees, and that you guys took care of the foundation and the framing. And I was I was wondering, you know, that to me it would seem like there'd be even additional profit in the project if you guys did that because you'd be keeping the profit from the subcontractors. You know, the fee they would have marked that up. You could also pocket that. So give us a little bit more insight into where the the profits are disappearing. Yeah, you know, actually, that that's a good point about versus um, what it would cost, um, say, my employees to do the framing and the foundation versus um, a subcontractor. Now, the way I ran it is because I like to sleep at night, and I've always I just run things on the books. So, yes, it was cheaper for me to have my employees do the framing and foundation than if I hired subcontractors to do it. But the savings, my client gets those savings. I didn't get the savings because I don't then go ahead and go, okay, well, here's a concrete subcontractor's bid. They're going to do it for 25 grand, but I know I can do it for 15 grand. Then I don't then go and, and, and make my bid at 25 grand. I make it at 15 grand because that's what it's going to cost me to do it. 
And I don't mark that up because I'm, you know, marking it up uh, at the end. And that's just the way, um, for me, ethically, it made sense. I'm sure other people uh, do it exactly kind of just like what you're mentioning. They'll, they'll, they'll figure out what their own is, and then they'll kind of just mark it up to the least competitive subcontractor. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the client does you know, the client doesn't know it doesn't affect them because they're still getting a decent price for the yeah. for the, the thing. Yeah. Well, going back to what we're saying before, I mean, I want to play devil, devil's advocate here. Once you be shortchanging yourself because you're still doing the, the work of managing the foundation, managing the framing, and if that's coming out of your, your GC budget, then why not, why not mark that up? Yeah, no, that is a good point, and um, and I think if I was to do it all over again, that is something I I would revisit because um, now I realize you need money to run this stuff, yeah. and it's not just enough in that profit and overhead sometimes uh, to do that. Even if you add a few thousand bucks on just to handle a couple of contingencies, uh, you know, if you just add a few thousand bucks to handle a couple of contingencies that might come up in your concrete or your framing or something like that, that you might just you might have missed while you're putting your numbers together. Um, that is something that uh, I think would definitely make sense or could make sense. Awesome. Well, I mean, I just love the information that we're getting here. You're giving a lot of concrete details, no pun intended. <laughs> I was just going to say pun intended, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it's your show, so no pun intended. <laughs> you know, something you did mention just now is you mentioned that in the world of contracting, there's a lot of gray and maybe even a lot of black going on in terms of the way that things are reported in the books. I mean, tell me a little bit, what did you see from the contractors? What are they doing out there that makes it difficult for someone who wants to be 100% legit? Um, what kind of pressure does that, tell me about that deal. Yeah, you know, I think in the residential world, uh, just contracting in general is, is different than in the commercial world. I think, uh, you know, contracting the commercial world uh, is more people, I think, just do things uh, by the books, more or less. Not saying, you know, shady stuff doesn't going on, isn't going on, but I think residentially, it just attracts a lot of different type of, uh, of people. Um, I'll give you an example, not that this is shady, but just in, as an example of, um, I guess, the, the way a lot of subcontractors treat their business. Um, you know, as you know, here in California, subcontractors are supposed to submit a preliminary 20-day notice uh, to the owner uh, before they start beginning work, letting them know the, the, to the owner that they have lien rights. And uh, commercially, as far as I understand, that's, that's a pretty common practice. It helps protect lien rights. Now, in residentially, uh, or residentially speaking, even in my years as just being an architect in 2002 on working in residential, I have never seen a sub submit a preliminary 20-day notice, with the exception of my uh, tile guy who was, he was an incorporated company. I mean, they ran this like a business, and they were the only subcontractors that ever submitted that preliminary 20-day notice, and it takes no time to do it, um, but I think there's such a, a, a range and level of of uh, subcontractors and there's no um, you know especially we as architects we want like okay this is how it's done in the field here's the checklist or here's what's supposed to be done it's just all over the place and these subcontractors are all over the place and um, I'll tell you well depending on how long we want to go but uh, with my plumber uh, who I told you a little bit about before but I'll just mention briefly the plumber my biggest headache, uh, not just um, this one particular plumber, but plumbers in general uh, that I've had work on other projects. Headache after headache, they, I don't know what it is. Uh, and I'm, if there's any plumbers listening to this, I'm sure you're a great plumber, but that's <laughs> not my experience. Um, and, and anybody that's thinking of hiring a plumber, I didn't realize this. Uh, and like so much like life, we learn it, uh, we, we learn it by going through it. Yeah. But there's really two types of plumbers. There's the plumber who's a house call plumber, and they're going to go to the house. They're going to go and you know fix your clogged drain, and they're going to get 150 bucks when they leave, or a couple hundred bucks, or whatever it is. Then there's plumbers who who do uh, like remodels, like that's their business, and they understand that they'll get a little bit of deposit for materials up front, and then they're not getting paid for maybe another month or six weeks, and then they'll get another chunk. I unfortunately 
had the remodeling plumber on my Westbourne job, the West Hollywood job. And I, I worked with him on a smaller job previously, and I, he was a little rough around the edges. He was, you know, gruff, but he was, he was responsive. He was good. However, on this West Hollywood job, getting near the end, you know, even in the middle, he, would, he, he was supposed to show up to do stuff on the job site. Turns out he wouldn't show up because he got a call for somebody's leaky toilet, and he could actually go make 200 bucks to put in his hand that day versus coming to my job where he knows he's not going to get paid for maybe another month. Which one are you going to go to? He's going to go to where he's getting the cash. And so that's just a little, just a little tip if anybody's dealing uh, with plumbers. So he was not, he was not actually a building, a building contractor. He was, he was your, your service sort of plumber. He, he really was. And, um, and you know, again, I should have probably called around to references. I should have called other contractors that he, he uh, worked for in the past. Um, and, but I didn't, you know, he worked well on this small project and, you know, I trusted him. And, you know, that wasn't enough. Yeah. Let's talk about some other maybe shady things that go on, because this is going to be competition for any architect that ventures into this field. Tell me about paying people under the table and evading taxes, because I see that happening frequently. Is that something that you saw? You know, um, I know from previous contractors I've worked with, they, um, they wouldn't necessarily fully report the workers' comp hours accurately. Because the way workers' comp works is you, you know, every month you have to fill out the workers' comp form and you fill it out for how many ever, how many ever hours um, you, your employees worked. And then you plug in the rate at which, you know, their, their, um, their, uh, the rate at which, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, the, drawing a blank here. I guess the the uh, the rate at which they, my God, I feel like I'm on a game show and I can't come up with the the million dollar answer. It's a hundred thousand dollars waiting. David. Yeah, I know, right? I can't. Whatever. Uh, like if they're a roofer or a contractor, like that rate, you know, it's going to be up or down depending on their their risk rate, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So then you add all that stuff up, and that's what you pay into workers' comp. You you send a check in for that amount every month. Now nobody's checking this as you're doing this. Um, so you could easily cheat. I mean, you could easily not report all the hours that, that somebody worked on your workers' comp because that's going to give you less of a payment to pay into workers' comp. Now, with that said, they may come and audit you, and they did that to me a couple of times where they will come to your office, and it's not like an IRS audit, but they'll come to your office and they'll want to, state fund is the main one, but they'll, they'll want to see your receipts and your invoices and all that stuff to make sure it all lines up with your workers' comp. Um, how they decide who gets audited or not, I have no idea. Um, but I think you know many of these contractors count on maybe not getting audited, or if they do, then they play some other game to, you know, to, to, to back up whatever they did, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let's let's talk a little bit more about some of the challenges and some of the mistakes. Give me an example of of some of the gotchas, so to speak. Uh, some more of the gotchas that you that you had. I mean, tell me about the plumber. <laughs> tell me about the plumber. That's a good story. Yeah, you know the the, the this plumber that that I was telling you about. Let's just his first name's Dennis. Um, he he did so many things wrong on, on this West Hollywood job. He undersized the the gas. Um, underneath, we re, we replumbed. He undersized the gas, and we didn't catch this till later. Um, and the problems of his showing up. But the biggest problem with him was the project is done. They move in at least a hundred thousand dollars worth of furniture. Everything is done, and uh, I get a call that they they're getting some brown stains in their ceiling. Right, two story uh, renovation. And we, we gutted the whole place, studs, everything. So I'm like, how is it possible that there are brown stains in the ceiling that we just did? So me and Steve, who I'm paying $35 an hour out of, physically out of my pocket to be with me to cut this drywall open right now, uh, we cut it open. The drywall is wet. The insulation is soaked. Luckily, we had a bucket below it. Water is just pouring down. And we're like, how is this even possible? Well, there's... Two, there's uh, Two toilets upstairs. Two toilets upstairs. Both 
were leaking. And they were basically leaking because of this plumber who ended up firing, um, didn't put the wax ring in. And for whatever reason, it was a dual flush toilet. Whatever reason, he thought he doesn't need the wax ring. I don't know. And the wax ring is like a $2.50 piece of wax that, that seats the toilet in. He didn't put it in. So they were using the, the toilet. And basically, this is like sewage overflowing in the whole thing. That's just, it's just, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. Uh, and I think I fired him. I fired him just before this happened. I think I think installing the toilets was one of the last things he did, and I eventually had to uh, fire him, and he was threatening me in the whole nine yards. So, cut to um, one of the one of the rooms when we're removing the the the. Um, so we cut out the drywall, and we cut we take out the the insulation, of course. Now there's mold. Mold has already started on the drywall. So now I have to get it. I have to get it tested, and I have to get it abated. So that was about three grand. And not to mention, I have to then explain this to the client. I have to be like, you know, I'm sorry, guys. You know, and they don't care what my plumber did. They look at me like you messed up. So and and they were actually very cool about this. I mean, this could have this could have went the total other way. Um, they weren't moved in yet. Um, Although actually I think they were, but they were they had their back house they could live in, whatever it was. So they thankfully they were totally cool. So had to get it abated, and that was three grand. And then of course the new insulation, new drywall, painting and matching, it just it's uh, it was a headache. Um, so that was done. And then what had happened? He also did the plumber also did something out, uh, something else out. But what this all boiled down to is he cost me about 15 or 16 grand out of my pocket, like cash that I had to pay out, which came out obviously of this profit that we were realizing there wasn't, you know, much there as we're whittling this down. So then I had to, to go after it. So um, he, he had general liability, which, by the way, he didn't have before this job, and he really didn't want to get it, and I made him get it. And I think it was like three grand. And I should have known, again, red flag, he didn't even have the three, the three grand to pay for the liability insurance. He had to finance it through the insurance company paying like 250 bucks a month. I, that, I should have known, like, this guy is not right for this project. Um, so I had to go after his bond and his general liability policy. So in California, the bond amount is $12,500. So what that means, contractors pay a couple hundred bucks a year for basically this kind of insurance, this bond. It's not general liability, it's just it's this bond that will help resolve any complaints a, a homeowner files against the contractor. So if a homeowner calls and says, you know, the painting's not done right, there's $2,000 in damage, the bonding company will step in and pay that um, that homeowner the two grand. And then the, the contractor's got to pay the bond company back or they're not going to get bonded again. So... Bond is 12500 but as I found out, when it's contracted to contractor, the bond limits at 7500 That other five grand is available only to homeowners. So I was like, okay, great. So I, I'm going after that 7500 and then I'm dealing with his general liability policy to get the difference, another like six grand. And I forget exactly how it shook out, but I ended up dealing with one guy at the general liability um, about this. I, I forget exactly why or how the bonding thing uh, got, got rolled into this. But then this went on for months. I mean, I had to show paperwork. I had to show pictures. And, you know, and I'm supposed to be getting new work at this point. Um, so we ended up settling, I want to say, eight months later. Uh, and, and, the, and the insurance guy was like, all right, how about we'll give you uh, nine grand and blah, 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 and you can't sue him, you can't come after him, or something like that. And I think I tried to get 10 or 11. I might have gotten 10. I went back, whatever it was. And he's like, okay, we'll do it. And I said, done. And they sent a check out, and that was it. So I lost money on that deal. Uh, but, again, you know, I learned a ton, but it was just uh, a disaster. Yeah, wow. You mentioned, so you've talked about two challenges so far, David, that I want to bring up. One was competing with contractors that may not be on the up and up or for instance you yes. know you're in you're in an industry where people um can maybe tweak the numbers a little bit and if you're not willing to do that it's going to put you at 
at a tougher position. And then the second thing is how to find the right people. So first of all, I'm going to ask you, do you have any suggestions for how to compete in a world where contractors are skirting a lot of the regulations? Or not all of them, but just some of them right. that do that makes it. How would you compete, suggestions to compete against that? You know, that is a tough one. Um, I guess the, the, the biggest thing I can um, recommend is, you know, a lot of this work comes to our personal relationships or business relationships, you know, really fostering those. And, you know, it, it's a great question, and it's not um, that different for just being an architect that I've experienced here in L.A. Because, um, as I said, you know, architects in L.A. typically get between 10 and 15 percent, and I've, all, I've settled around 12 and a half percent. But in L.A., there's a lot of unlicensed people here. There's a lot of people who will do it for less um, that will do it, I don't know, 5 percent, you know, a couple grand or whatever it is. So it's that same level of competition. So when I, when I meet a new client, um, I explain to them, you know, I, I have a whole list of this is the fee, this is how it works, this is what we do, this is what we provide. And, you know, sometimes they might say, well, we know so-and-so will do it for 8% or we'll do it for less. And I explain to them, I say, look, any licensed architect who's running a legitimate business can't do it for less than 10%. They just can't. And if they are, they're cutting corners to deliver you the product. And I, I, you know, I just throw it back in their court. And if they, if if that's okay with them, and we decide to work with it together, great. If they don't, that's great too, because I also don't want to work with you know somebody who doesn't understand our value. Awesome. So now the second question is, how do you weed out the people like your plumber buddy and find good people? You know, that is um, that is the 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 biggest challenge. You know, and I'll tell you a challenge in all of this is is you know we might think. Uh, especially if we're working in residential as an architect, we develop these relationships with these subcontractors who are on our job sites. Um, but the contractor, the general contractor, is going to be very leery of us trying to pill for them to, for our own business. So just be careful there um, because these are relationships they've developed over the years. They don't want necessarily somebody coming in and just taking them. Um, even though obviously the contractor, the subcontractor could work for both, but it's sort of more of the relationship. It's just the way the, the things are set up. Um, it's hard. I mean, I've had contractors who've been in this for years have trouble with drywall guys, for example. I remember this one job, I was doing this condo renovation, and this contractor, the drywall guy just made a mess. So he had to go find another drywall guy, even though he's been doing this for years. So. It's really difficult. Uh, I think probably the biggest thing is calling other contractors that they've worked with and getting a recommendation or you know, finding out about them. That's probably the, the first, make sure they're licensed. Um, but two, yeah, call the other general contractors they've had a relationship with because if they've had a good relationship, they'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> so let's see. So besides the fact that you didn't make a whole lot of money, you struggle with contractors and construction defects. This is such an inspiring <laughs> podcast, isn't it? <laughs> you had to clean up poo poo out of the uh, out of the ceiling with uh, with a guy you were paying thirty five bucks an hour. Exactly. Um, why did you decide to wind down the design build business? That's a good question too. Um, and you know, it's uh, it really came down to um, time. And, and time, as I've realized over the last few years, time is the most important thing to me. And, you know, frankly, it's the most important thing any of us have because our time is limited. That we know. How limited? We don't know. Um, but, you know, this, I was spending 60, 70 hours a week, and this was all I was doing. Um, I wasn't rock climbing, I wasn't backpacking, I wasn't hiking, I wasn't doing anything, I wasn't going on vacation. All I was doing was this design build business. That was it. It was all consuming. So I was spending a lot of time doing it. Again, I enjoyed it, but, um, but you know, it was funny for if anybody is uh, a Breaking Bad fan. Are you a Breaking Bad fan, by the way? I'm not. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> oh, man, you got to watch it. Uh, but there, but there's this scene at, at the end, uh, maybe a little bit of a spoiler, but where Walt, the main character, uh, is talking to his his um, ex-wife, and um, you know, all through Breaking Bad, Walt has been saying, 
you know, I, I, I turned into this, you know, meth dealer because I want to, I'm going to die of cancer and I want to make money for my family. Like I want to leave money for my family. So throughout the whole series, his reason for doing this was to provide for his family. And at the end of the, the, the season or the end of the, the series, uh, he's, he's with his ex-wife one more time and he starts saying, you know, Skylar, the reason I did this. And she goes, Walt, I don't want to hear any more about how you did it for the family. And he says, the reason I did this is I did it for me. And it felt good, and I liked doing it, and I was good at it. And she didn't say anything to that. And it was the first time that he kind of came clean and admitted that he did it for him, you know. Um, so I can identify uh, with that, not the whole meth building uh, side of things, but in the sense that um, I was in this uh, this three year design build, what I really call a fog. I mean, my my life was a fog then, and I always told um, you know my my wife then that I'm doing this for the family. Like, the, you know, I can't. There's nothing else I can do here. I'm doing this for the family. You know, the, it was the same conversation over and over again, which I was. I mean, I was trying to provide for the family. I was the one who was working. We had two young boys uh, at the time, so I was. But in that moment, I forgot. I basically forgot the, my, the results of my action to my family. And that, that's really what happened, not unlike Walt and Breaking Bad. So... What had happened is we went through, you know, the marriage went on the rocks and, and I tried everything to save it. But by that time, it was too late. And we went through a, a very amicable divorce um, a couple of years ago. But it's not that the design build business sort of killed our marriage. But I'll, I'll say it was a big part of it um, because she was home alone with the boys. I was working all the time. We'd have dinner together. I get back on the computer and I do more work. So I was not uh, available to her or my boys, like, at all. Um, and so that's where it comes back to time. And as a result of our dissolved marriage, uh, we, you know, we have an agreement. We each have the, the boys 50% of the time, so, which I love. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have a job where I work more than 40 hours a week now anyway. Uh, and I love that. Because now, um, when I am with my boys, who I love dearly, they're five and seven, I am 100% present when I'm with them. I'm not thinking about work. I'm not thinking about, you know, the ceiling I got to replace. So it's pretty incredible in that respect. And I, I did not balance work life at all during the design build. I, you know, I just didn't have a system in place to do it. And... Um, so it's, it's bittersweet that the design business or the design build business sort of I chose to, to wind it down. Um, but given everything that was happening at the time, it was, it was the right decision. And, and speaking of time, um, the, the thing that I realized most about kids and, you know, from my boys, you know, other than wanting Legos and Ninjago stuff and, you know, other stuff they want us to buy them. But really, all they want is our time. All they want is our attention. And, you know, Jake or Remy, so often they'll be like, can you just watch us draw? Or can you watch us do the homework? Or can you watch us build this? Like, that is all they want. So I didn't get any of that for the three years I did design build. I was just completely clueless. Uh, and somewhere around 2010, a couple, you know, two or three years ago, going through this marriage breaking down, design build not working out the way I wanted, somehow I just saw the light. And it just became clear to me. My priorities became clear. Uh, and again, it just all came back to time is the most important thing. Wow. Well, you know, this, this show definitely is about the business of architecture and how to run a successful business. But I think that's an awesome way to end the interview is just remembering at the end of the day, the reason we want to run a good business is because we want to have dinner with our friends, with our family, with our kids. Yeah, and be present with them. Yep. You know, just be, 
which it's difficult enough to do that anyway. I mean, we're all on our phones, and, and just to just to be present with somebody is it's the biggest gift you can give them. That's awesome. You know, just, just their attention. Yeah, you know? you know, you really, I really have goosebumps um, from the story about the uh, Breaking Bad. It made me definitely reflect on my time with my own kids. So, and, thanks for that. And I think as architects, we we sort of gravitate towards that sort of uh, not even ego driven, maybe a little ego driven, but that sort of like like you get in the zone, like architecture school, like that is all that matters, you know. And when you're in there, like that, you just got blinders on. It's not like it's not like uh, you don't love other people. It's not like um, you're disrespecting other people, but you just don't realize the effects that what you're doing has a direct effect on the people around you, and you don't realize it. You know, it's crazy. Absolutely, David. Just to end up here, would you ever do yeah. design build again? Uh, I you know I probably wouldn't. I, you know, part let, of let's me say, can I can I interject? Let, yeah. Let's say let's say your exam prep academy. Um, business, you know, you didn't have that. So let's say you were a traditional architect because that probably throws something else in the mix. Right. So answer the question from that perspective. Um, if I had to, um, you know, if let's say uh, architect exam prep, CSE prep goes away, um, you know, and the, the residential work I do is not, not making enough, then I probably would do the design build again, and I'm glad you phrased it that way because I enjoyed it, uh, and I'm a lot smarter uh, this time around. So I would be better at it, and I would know the systems and stuff to create, um, you know, ahead of time. With that said, because I'm with my boys a lot, it would I would have to definitely strike uh, that time balance, which is just time management, uh, which I could surely do. Um, but, you know, I think like anything running a business, the better we plan it, the, the, the better we visualize it, the, 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 the better chances we have at success. And I didn't do any of those things. I just jumped in. And, and you know, and that's kind of what happens when you jump in. Because it's fun. I mean, uh, yeah. Because it's, it's cool. I mean, it's cool to be the designer and to see you're responsible for it building, too. I mean, it's cool. And I like the collaborative process. I mean, I had a lot of good experience with subs. I had some great subs, and you learn a lot from them. So it's it's fun. Awesome. Well, David, it's been an information-packed interview. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, you forgot to ask me my quotes. Well, I didn't know if you had them ready. Give me your quotes. Of course I have quotes. Well, let's finish up with the quotes. All right. There's, there's, there's three quotes, but I'll, I'll give you two. The, the first one is one that I've just always liked, and it's from Henry Ford, and it says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So that one is cool. It's just the, the mental mindset. Let's pause on um, that for a second. Let's tell me yeah. what that means to you. It means it's all in our head. It's all the stories we create in our head. So he's saying, you know, if you think you can do it, then you can do it. If you think you can't do it, then you can't do it. So it's that, that internal dialogue that we have with ourselves. And I've just, for whatever reason, have um, always been optimistic. Um, yeah, I have fears like everybody else, uh, but I try not to let the fears overtake, you know, what I really want to do. Uh, and some of us are just more prone to that, you know, than others. Um, the second one is, is not maybe so poetic, but uh, it's from Eminem, and uh, I'm a big fan, and I know his lyrics and all that stuff, but, um, but it's the one that when it gets down to the grind, it's the one that you, when you're in it, whether you know I'm training for a marathon or I'm running the marathon or just like when things just are tough, um, this is the one that comes to mind. So it, uh, it is, success is my only mother, effing option, failure's not. And I mean that that's it. Uh and, and it's a, it's from a song Lose Yourself and it just it gets me every time and, and many times I've been training on marathon runs and, and I need to put that one on because you just failure's not an option. Wow. Wow. Do you have a good business book that you've read lately that you can recommend to the audience? You know, I do. I have two books. Um of course the biography of Steve Jobs by uh, Walter Isaacson. Fantastic book, and and I'll say I'm not. I've become maybe an Apple fanboy the last few years, but certainly while he was alive doing his thing, I didn't really pay attention. I wish I had, 
Um, and I listened to it on Audible, actually. Dylan Baker narrates it. it. It's a thick book, and it took a while to get through it. But but if you're an audio person, definitely check it out because it was fantastic. Uh, and then the second one is Onward uh, by Howard Schultz, How Starbucks Fought for Its Life Without Losing Its Soul. Fantastic business book because what Howard Schultz did, who created uh, Starbucks, he, he basically... I can't remember the exact years now, sometimes maybe in the late 90s. He stepped back. He stayed on board, but he stepped back as CEO, as CEO, and Starbucks lost its luster. And they were just building them everywhere, and they just were not running it properly. And he stepped back in, and he, 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 he made it successful again. I think when he stepped back in, let's say the stock was way down at, like, maybe 10 bucks a share, and now it's up to like 76 a share. I mean, he really single-handedly turned it around. So in that book, Onward, he shares a lot of that. And it's, it's fascinating because, first off, he writes like he's a human being and not like some CEO. So there's, there's ways he, he wrote things to employees. There's things that he did that are very relatable. So if anybody's looking for some like straight business inspiration, that's a fantastic book. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for the suggestion, David. And I want to let all of our listeners know that if they go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash book, they can get an Audible free audiobook download as part of their initial trial. So you oh, mentioned that's that cool. you can get that on audio, and that's just one way that they can they can get those audiobooks. If they're already producing, uh, listening to podcasts, probably audiobooks are right in the line. So that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash book. Oh, that's a, that's that would be very cool. Yeah, get the get the Walter Isaacs and uh, Steve Jobs one for sure. Awesome, awesome. Well, David, it's been great having you on the show. Enoch, it was uh, it was a real pleasure. Uh, hopefully, I didn't uh, crush too many spirits with uh, with the reality. I guess I should say the reality of my design build experience. You know, somebody else could have a, a completely uh, different experience, but uh, it's it's a great business model. Thank you for sharing. All right. Thanks, Enoch. Okay. I will uh, talk to you soon. All right. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you as an architect can raise your fees, land the projects you love to work on, and get the time in your day back, join the members-only Business of Architecture Insider list for free by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter your best email address there, and I will send you instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week, keep rocking and go conquer the world. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway. <laughs>